Good morning. Glad to see everybody here on a bright, sunshiny day. What's that? Not everyone's here, Sonny said. But I know Pam and I are glad to be back, back with our family. And uh, today's May 1st. Wow. I'm, it's hard to believe that May is here already. But Well, the, uh, the scripture I chose for today comes from John uh, 35 through 42. It says, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means, when translated, it is Peter. Good morning, everybody. Let's begin our worship. Take your songbook, if you would, please. Number 371, if you'd like to follow along with music. Otherwise, the words will be up on the screen. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Number 371, please stand right where you are, if you're able to stand, and let's sing all three of these verses together. Thank you. 
And another song, number 232. Songs that get us thinking about what Jesus did for us. Today we're going to be celebrating communion and the children will stay here during communion. And these songs are all meant to get our minds going in that direction. 232 is Lead Me to Calvary. Disputes about the Bible and about its teachings are very common in the world, and they have been since the church first began in Acts chapter 2. There is one particular controversy that has persisted throughout the centuries, the greatest Bible thinkers, the greatest philosophers have pondered it, and still to this day there is no clear-cut answer on the perennial question, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? <laughs> now, I know that sounds like a silly question. But it is a question that is rooted in basic biology. You are here today because the biological seed of a biological male commingled with the biological egg of a biological female. 
That's basic reproductive health 101. Every one of you has one mother and one father, and that's the way it works. And as you are being formed in your mother's tummy, there is a line of nutritional communication that connects her tummy to your tummy. And once you're born, you no longer need that umbilical cord, but you all retain evidence of the fact that you were once dependent and connected to somebody who carried you to term. Adam and Eve did not have that umbilical connection to a mother. So the question for your dinner table today is, did God create Adam and Eve with or without a belly button? Today we are in Ephesians chapter 6 as we march our way through this marvelous epistle trying to figure out how to be a listening church. And today we find ourselves in the section where the conversation has moved from church relationships to family relationships, actually marriage relationships. And now this morning it's about the family relationships as it relates to the kiddos. Uh, would have been super cool if this would have fallen right on Mother's Day, but, uh, but that's all right. We'll just deal with the text as it comes along. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. There is a fourth thing that I could have said about why kids should obey their parents, and that is because obedience protects us. Now, every person... I know, I should take that back, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Most people that I know carry around some kind of daddy wound, some kind of a father injury. Maybe your dad was uh, generally a good guy, but did some things that marked you for your life. And when you think about life, you think about those things. There might be a few of you here who had saints, for fathers. And uh, um, if that's you, then make friends with Ben Davis because you guys form a small club of having perfect fathers. <laughs> Most of us, though, are, are, we make mistakes, dads, don't we? We all make mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes leave uh, an indelible mark of some kind. Uh, I remember a spanking one time from my dad, and this didn't mark me in a bad way. It was the best spanking I ever got. Sometimes he spanked me in frustration. Uh, sometimes he was irritated, and my brothers and I were just being loud, and he would spank us because uh, he was angry, and not a good way to discipline children when you're angry. Uh, we all understand that, but a well-thought-out paddling, well-timed, well-delivered, in the, in the context of a meaningful relationship, that's a, good, that's a good paddling. And I remember the one my dad gave. I've forgotten the hundreds of others that I got, but I do remember this one distinctly because it made such an impact. Uh, we lived in a small rural community where everyone protected their homes with firearms as the Constitution endorses us to do. And when we were first moving into that rural community, we were looking at the house one night and we were showing some relatives the new house that we hadn't yet closed on, but we're going to buy. Now, what we didn't know, what you don't know, is that that house used to be the house of, of a grandma and grandpa who were part of the relatives of that community. But they sold grandpa and grandma's farm because grandpa and grandma passed and, uh, 
And now it was going to someone outside the family. But we were just excited to show the farm to our relatives. And so we drove up in our vehicle and shined the lights on the house one night and just sat in the driveway uh, looking at the property, telling them all about it. When within two minutes, we were pinned in on both sides with pickup trucks and shotguns in the front seats of those pickup trucks being held, wondering, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? Well, we learned very quickly about how safe our neighborhood was in that respect. When I was a boy, there were two things that were invariably true. One was that if I was barefooted, I could run faster. I don't know why, but I could. Magic. And the other thing was that if I was riding my bicycle at night, I could ride faster. I don't know why, but it was true. And so as a young boy, I was riding my bicycle fast on our gravel, rural country road. And I rode down to the neighbors, and they had a driveway that was a big circle. It went all the way through the barns around the house, and I drove down through the barns around the house. When I got home, and my dad found out that I had been riding my bike through the neighbors at nighttime, well, it was dark out, uh, he said, don't you remember what happened when we bought this house? Don't you remember that our neighbors might want to protect their home if they think that it's being broken into? Don't you? And I'm like, yeah. And so he said, I have to spank you now, son, because I don't want you to get shot by mistake because they think you're a burglar. If you're going to ride around at night, people have to know that that's you riding around at night. And he gave me the most sober, calm, paddling that I had ever gotten from him. And to, obviously, to this day, I remember it. I remember it with vividness. So one of the other reasons why we want our kids to obey us is because our commands protect them. Verse number four is specifically to fathers. And so I bring that up to you dads to say, don't be an overbearing father. Don't hammer your kids with impatience, with dumb rules that are only for your comfort. Don't irritate them in the way that you interact with them, the kind of role model that you uh, are giving them for how to treat their wife. You, you don't want to provoke your kids to anger. That, that's what the scripture is saying here. My translation says don't exasperate your kids, but many of your translations will have it a little bit different. Don't provoke them. Treat Remember, we've been talking about Jesus is our example. He's our example for how to be a husband, our example for how to be a wife, our example for how to conduct ourselves with one another in the church. In this paternal relationship, dads, God is your example. Your heavenly father is not annoying. He doesn't nitpick you with dopey rules. He encourages you, trains you, loves you, guides you gently, steadily, firmly when necessary. That's what we want to do. Take a look in your Bibles for just a minute in the book of Proverbs where we see this whole idea being talked about. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1, right at the very beginning of the book of Proverbs. I'm going to, to read for you, and you can follow along verses 1 through 9. And the whole point of, of trying to help build into the lives of those children that God has given us is not because we're raising children. It's because we're raising adults. And that's a really different way to think about your task. Those of you who garden, you're not raising sprouts. You're raising plants, full-blown plants that produce fruit. That's the objective. The objective is the end result. It's not, it's not just the, the breakthrough of the seed. You're not raising a child. You're raising an adult. And here's how we do it. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just, and fair for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. So moms and dads, Christian education really begins first and foremost with you. Please, please do not rely upon one hour of church once a week to give your children the Christian education they need. You would not send your kids to school for one hour a week in order to get instruction in the three R's. You Give them lots of instruction, five days a week, even helping them at home in the evening. Do not send your kids to youth, I mean, send your kids to youth group, but do not trust that a couple hours of youth group, one night a week, is going to somehow make your kids into everything they need to be. The responsibility for Christian training rests with mom and dad. And grandpas and grandmas, what a blessing you can be to help step in and add to what mom and dad are already doing, praying not just for, but praying with the children. At Christmas time, don't just get them a new bike and a new video game. Get them a Bible. Get them a Bible study book. Get them some kind of a series of Bible history where characters are celebrated. Get them a subscription to some kind of, of, of Bible software where they can play Bible games on the computer. And so that every day in all aspects of life, they're just pulling in scripture and, and Bible stories and uh, they're for their faith is being fertilized and watered and cultivated. It's training them up in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. That's the objective for dads. Well, let's talk for the time that we have left about obedience. Because uh, obedience is the command here in Ephesians chapter 6. And as youngsters, we... Learn disciplined obedience to an authority so that as we grow, we can learn not only obedience to our earthly parents, but also obedience to our heavenly parent. Did you ever think about that? You learn to be obedient to God partly from when you're a child and you're learning obedience to your parents. It's all about learning to live under authority, and it starts when the children are very, very little. So children, you submit to your parents. That's where we are today. But if you remember backwards in these sermons that were before, it's wives in the marriage are submissive to their husbands. In the congregation, the church people are submissive to one another. As citizens in a in a, a civic environment, we are submissive to the governing authority. And by the way, here in the United States, the governing authority is not elected officials. The governing authority is a written document called the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So as you think about submission to authority, don't get sucked into the idea that the president is the king or our governor in Michigan is the queen of Michigan. No, 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 no. They are elected officials. They can be voted in. They can be voted out. Our authority is the written authority of the Constitution. And as citizens of this, this uh, land, we submit ourselves to the Constitution. Employees submit in the workplace. And I'm going to be talking about this a little bit more next week because those, that, those relationships are addressed directly. And uh, as a gathered church, just like any church that's meeting anywhere in the world today, we submit ourselves to Christ. So you see, the authority, there's always authority. Even, even within the Godhead, there's authority because Jesus, the Son, submitted to the Father. We all are under authority. We all are constantly learning, and it begins when we're children. And so we've got this command in Ephesians that says we are to honor our father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. That commandment was given back in Exodus chapter 20, when the Hebrew people were given the commands of what God expected for them. One of those commands was honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you and that you may live in the land that God is giving you. That was the promise. 
that it might go well. It's good for us to honor our parents even when we're grown up. And I want to talk about that. What is the relationship between us and our parents when we're adults? And how do we move from the command, children, obey your parents, when we're no longer children, but we still have the command, honor your father and mother? That's our question for today. And I have a few thoughts for you. One is this, parents, uh, those of you who are adults and you have adult parents who are still alive, uh, you, you don't boss around your 20-year-old the same way you boss around your two-year-old. At least I hope you don't. The manner of guidance grows with the child. It changes as the child needs change. Control starts very high, and then as the child ages, that control diminishes, and you move from being the one who can command and expect that there will be obedience to someone who offers suggestions. So I say to my adult children often, hey, well, have you considered? I'm not going to boss them to do something. I only suggest that maybe they might try. It's worked for me. And, and I move from being that authoritarian or person in their life to just being authoritative, but a guide from the side. That's different as the kids grow. And and so with we, we as our, with our parents now, those of you who are adults and have your parents alive, you're beginning to learn what that relationship is like, or you've become very comfortable in it. Any parent who uses this Bible verse in order to cudgel an adult person into compliance is the same kind of control freak who uses Ephesians 5.22 as a cudgel to beat his wife into submission. It's the same behavior. This is not proof that you can boss your adult kids around. So don't use this as a proof text for that. I believe that submission to parental authority and honoring our parents grows from being the obedient child to being an honoring peer. I'm talking about respect. A respect in the way we speak about our parents, a respect in the way we treat them, and respect for the indispensable role that they played in you being here in the first place. They may not be perfect, but they had it together enough in order to bring you into existence. And particularly your mother, who had it together enough to bring you to term and to see you be delivered. I think that that's remarkable. And that little fact cannot be dismissed because mom is this and dad is that and they did this and they said that and so I don't have to honor them anymore because those, man, I don't even want to call them anymore. I don't want them in my life anymore. You wouldn't have a life if it weren't for them. And so this command to honor does not have a statute of limitations that goes away just because you turned 18. Granted, you're not a child, you don't need to obey, but you do need to honor them because of who they are and the role they play in your existence. So what does it mean to give honor? Well, here's a couple of scripture thoughts for you. We won't turn there, I'll just read them for you. Titus 3. Titus 3, Paul says to Titus to remind the people to be subject to rulers. Now listen, as I read the scripture, listen for what is honorable to an authority. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. In 1 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and says, "Uh, first I tell you to pray for all people. This is 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, if you're going to take notes and look it up later. First I tell you to pray for all people, asking God for what they need and being thankful to him. And pray for rulers and for all who have authority so that we can have quiet and peaceful lives full of worship and respect for God. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, 
Who wants all people to be saved and to know the truth? So I believe that honoring our parents is a posture of the mind. And what I mean by that is that we set our minds in a way toward our parents where we esteem them as highly valuable people. We view them as precious. They are worthy to understand and they are worthy of our consideration. We esteem them by praying for them. We esteem them by trying to love them in a way that would help them to feel like we love them. I made the joke during the kids' sermon that we want our kids to grow up and move away, but we don't want them to stay away, do we? Your kid, your parents don't want you to stay away. If your parents are still alive, they love you to come around. Most parents I know will always in their hearts be your mom and your dad, and they delight in being a part of your life. Welcome their input into your life. You, you, you may not follow it. You certainly aren't obligated to follow it, but you're their child, and, and they want what's best for you, and so they're going to tell you what they think is best for you. You honor them by listening and giving them the time to hear what they have to say. You speak to them and about them with words that are kind and respectful and gentle and humble. You don't want to be the kind of a kid who's like, hey, thanks for raising me, appreciate it, good 18 years, I'm out of here. And they never look back. 18 years, they carried you. 18 years, they supported you. You lived in their house. 18 years, they paid the bills. 18 years. I so often say it, my mother moved into our house, as you all, many of you know that. And uh, this month marks the first year of her living with us. And uh, she, she often says, I don't know, I feel like I'm just imposing on you guys. And, and uh, she really likes living with us, just Michelle and me and her. And, and I say to her off, I say, Mom, what you did for me for 18 years, how can I not be willing to look after you? Now, that works really good in my life because my mom's a very gracious person and very easy to live with, and we all get along just fine. In your situation, that may not work as a shared living arrangement, but that doesn't mean you're not involved. It doesn't mean that you help them by getting the in-home care they need or help them by getting them into assisted living. Help by maybe paying even a portion of their monthly assisted living bill in order to see that they're properly cared for. And sometimes you think, well, that's not my job. Why isn't it your job? We're, we're a family system. And as a system, you got grandpas and grandmas and great grandmas and grandchildren. And we're in this together as a family. That's what being a family means. And, and one way you can honor your parent if they're on a fixed income and you've got the wealth to do it is help them out they helped you out why can't you reciprocate be patient with them be present be involved in their lives if they're willing now i have two questions i'm going to answer and we'll wrap this up today um, the question that i think that some of you are going to ask is well what if my parents are dead how do i obey this command if my parents are not here? That's a great question. And so I would say, remember them. You remember them with photos and with respect. Uh, I often wear a wristwatch, which I don't happen to have today, but it's a wristwatch that was my dad's. I remember seeing it on his big old hairy arm when I was a boy. And, and uh, so now I've got that watch. I've paid to have it fixed twice uh, because it's an old wind-up watch. And I've already paid way more in repairs than the dumb thing's even worth. But I put it on and I remember, I had a dad. My dad loved me. My dad provided for me. And having that watch helps me remember. I'm just part of a whole history of people who went before me, who will come after me. I'm one link in the children's book, if you like children's literature, The Long Dog Chain. That's in the book called The Diggingest Dog is a great book for kids. But uh, be grateful for all your parents have done. Even if they're not here, you can still be grateful. Um, if they have one, you can see to it that their grave marker is not growing with lichen and covered in dirt. And, you know, you don't have to go and every year even. Just you look after it in honor of them. And you speak of them. You speak of them deceased honorably because the posture of your mind is 
esteeming them. Next question, what if my parents are challenging? Like they have really, really difficult personalities, uh, they're criminals, or they're mentally ill. Well, Jeff Davis, let's talk about that. <laughs> Mike was tough to potty train, but he didn't have to get bailed out of jail. I'm told that that's what his father said about him. Did I get that right, Mike? <laughs> the method of honoring a difficult parent is, is again, it's, it's not different. It's just more difficult. The command is there no matter what, and you don't get excused from the command just because your father's in prison or because your mother was horrible. With God's help, you can obey and you can posture your mind toward esteeming them. There are ways that you can do that. You always remember the fact that without them, you wouldn't exist. You remember the fact that they are image bearers of God. They are handcrafted by God, made in his image, as broken as they have become. They are still his handiwork. I, I, love, uh, I love Mr. Rogers, who said this. As human beings, our job in life is to help people realize how rare and valuable each one is really is, and that each one of us has something that no one else has or ever will have, something inside that is unique to all time, and it's our job to encourage each other and discover that uniqueness and to provide ways of developing its expression. We are part of a family. We are part of a, a biological family. We are part of a church family. We're part of a community. But right now, we are thankful primarily today, we are thankful primarily uh, for being a part of God's family because we want to be a church, a listening church that is the kind of church that pleases the Lord. Let's stand together as we close with the song, uh, The Family of God, just that one chorus. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Thank you for your graciousness to us. Thank you for the way that you always meet us where we are, but never leave us where you find us. And we pray that you would continue uh, to form in us the character of your son, Jesus, so that in all of our relationships, that we can exemplify the one who loved us so well. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all.